if a decline in the use of hydrocarbons is environmentally necessary. It's important to understand that it is also going to be economically unavoidable in future decades. Indeed, the end of the era of low-cost hydrocarbons is at hand. All of the easily exploitable large pools of so-called, of, of oil of so-called uh, light sweet crude have probably been discovered. The oil industry will be forced to look harder, dig deeper and spend more to find crude oil that will be ever more difficult to refine. At the same time, demand for energy is surging to new heights, led by rapidly industrializing countries like China, India and Brazil. You don't have to be an economist to see where this leads us over a long period of time. Now from an environmental perspective, the supply crunch ought to be a godsend. The more expensive oil gets, the more competitive, cleaner, greener energy alternatives will become, and the more imperative conservation will become. Yet, even with staggering price increases, no mass swearing off of hydrocarbons is occurring. The extraordinary concern about climate change has not to date led to the supply of enough clean, widely available, reasonably priced alternatives to satisfy the exponential increases in global energy demand. So this is our challenge. Now let me tell you how Canada is trying to meet this challenge. First of all, bluntly put, ladies and gentlemen, we are playing catch-up. When we came to office in 2006, Canada's emissions were almost 29% higher than our Kyoto target and on track to continue to rise very rapidly. In fact, if Canada had continued on the business as usual path we were on, our emissions would be in the range of 65% higher than our Kyoto target by 2020. We cannot repeat our previous error. We must set targets that are achievable. We started by asking ourselves for some hard-headed questions like what are realistic emissions reductions targets for Canada and how exactly will we achieve them? In answering this question, we quickly concluded that the key to ensuring that we balance emissions reductions with the, is the key to this is ensuring, I should say, that we balance emissions reductions with the impact of such actions on the country's economy. Now I know that in some circles it is not politically correct to suggest that environmental targets must be balanced with economic imperatives. And it is true that economic growth on our planet cannot be sustained without better environmental conservation preservation. But it is equally true, as the current reaction to high energy prices in Europe is starting to show, that environmental progress will never be achieved unless the economic needs of the population are being met. So our targets need to be realistic, practical and achievable. But to be clear, we still must have targets. We will, in a relatively short period of time, restrain and reverse the growth of GH, uh, GHG emissions. We intend to lower Canada's emissions 20% below 2006 levels by 2020 and aim for a reduction of 60 to 70% by 2050. In fact, our midterm 2020 target is going forward one of the most aggressive emissions reduction goals in the world. Industries will be expected to produce 18% less greenhouse gases per unit of production in 2010 compared to 2006. And those targets will get tougher by 2% each year, each and every year. This will lead, and this is important, to absolute reductions in emissions, not just reduce carbon intensity will lead to an absolute 20% reduction, as I've said, by 2020. Canadian industries that do not meet their emissions reductions targets will be required to do one of three things. They will have access to a domestic carbon trading system, which will include offset credits for non-industrial practices that reduce emissions. We will, we eventually hope, to participate in a North American trading regime, depending on what action the United States takes. And I'll talk about that in a second. We likewise hope to participate someday in a more mature and robust emissions trading regime internationally. As well, industries that do not meet their target can pay into a fund that will be used to develop and deploy new clean energy technologies. In other words, we want to use economic incentives to directly stimulate the technolo technological transformation 
that will be required to balance emissions reduction with economic growth. Let me just say a quick word about the oil sands, which has been one of the largest growth sectors in our greenhouse gas emissions. First, last year, we began removing the special tax incentives brought in by our predecessors that actually encourage, subsidize the traditional growth or the growth of the traditional oil sands industry. We are phasing those out and replacing them with incentives for the deployment of green technology only. Second, our targets in the oil sands go well beyond the standards for other industries. For new oil sands projects, we will require emissions reductions equivalent to what would be achieved through the implementation of carbon capture and storage. But again, and this is important, these targets for the oil sands are not dependent on the actual deployment of the technology. We will, we will require that scale of reduction, the equivalent reductions, regardless. New oil sands operations will only be permitted if they can massively reduce their emissions. I should mention that while our plan will effectively establish a price on carbon of $65 a ton, growing to that rate over the next decade, our government has opted not to apply carbon taxes. The purpose, the central purpose of our plan is to create certainty about emissions reductions, not to raise revenue for the government. Our plan will compel industry not just to pay for their carbon emissions, but to actually reduce them. Industry has told us they want and they need certainty. Our framework provides that, clear targets, realistic timelines, fair across the board application. Now industry knows what they need to do and when they need to do it. Look, when all is said and done, Canada produces only 2% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So the true environmental benefit of our action plan will only be realized if we are part of an effective and truly international emissions reduction regime. And the fact is that the entire developed world acting alone can barely make a dent in global greenhouse gas emissions. Countries which accepted targets under the Kyoto Protocol today account for less than 30% of global emissions. And this is going to inevitably and continually decline in the years to come. China is already likely, we haven't got the latest stats, but China is already likely the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And emissions from other major developing countries such as India and Indonesia are also growing rapidly. But even if the developed world completely eliminated its greenhouse gas emissions, 100%, which obviously is not attainable. The purple line is the upward trend. Global emissions in the next 50 years, even under that scenario, would still double. Now let me talk for a moment, if you don't mind, about the United States. Between a new president and the next Congress, we are confident that we will see a will to make real domestic progress in the United States on the issue of emissions and climate change. But let me tell you, it will be realistic progress. We will never, never see the United States ratify an international protocol that does not require genuinely global action. That is, we will never see the United States ratify an international agreement if that agreement both hurts it competitively and fails to reduce emissions internationally. Remember that the United States Senate rejected Kyoto 95 to 0. And at that time, emissions from developing countries were far smaller than they are today. Developed countries like ours can afford to do more and do it faster. Differentiated strategies are welcome and are necessary. But if we want non-Kyoto countries like the United States, China, and other major developing economies to be part of the solution, then we will have to bring them all into the solution, or the reality is that none of them are going to be in the solution. And if that happens, all of our efforts, Canada, in Europe, and elsewhere, at stopping climate change, while noble, will be largely ineffective. There is, however, a powerful gathering tide of political will in all of our countries to do better, and there are brutal supply and demand realities that will force change with or without that political will. Canada will do its part. Going forward, our Turning the Corner plan will achieve results very similar to the benchmarks set by the European Union between now and 2020. We will also advocate at home and abroad 
a moratorium on new dirty, dirty uh, coal power plants, better control on heavy oil operations, the peaceful use of nuclear power, and targets for clean electricity generation. But the bottom line is that global warming is a global problem, and we will not solve it unless our, our environmental plans are economically balanced and unless the whole world joins the cause. That is my message to you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, and thank you once again for your invitation and your attention.